Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to have you here at what we hope will be um, a very engaged and hopefully enlightening panel on illicit trade and illicit financial flows. Perhaps to put it a little into context, um, I will share with you that recently, in order to honor the UN's 75th anniversary, our branch at the, in uh, the Division of Globalization and Development Strategies was asked to write a, a brief history on how um, the UN had been engaging with topics like debt and development finance since its inception. The archive documents make for fascinating reading, and what was apparent at the time of the establishment of the UN at the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, and then subsequently the establishment of UNCTAD in 1964, was that discussions on trade and development could not and indeed did not take place without discussion and analysis on finance, sources of finance, and financial flows. So I think that's primarily why there is a session on illicit financial flows in a two-day workshop on illicit trade. Because finance oils the wheels of trade and financial flows are intricately linked to illicit trade. Someone remarked yesterday, you can do all the enforcement of illicit trade you want, close down every illegal plant, but if you can't follow the money, you're deluding yourself. The twin pathologies of illicit trade and illicit financial flows work to disempower nation states, particularly, it must be said, developing countries. Because it takes resources from mobilizing the domestic resources so desperately need, needed to fill the development gap in those countries. Our division recently undertook some research which examined what a group of some 30 less developed developing countries and some middle income countries would have to do to deliver on the first four SDGs. You may know those are no poverty, nutrition, good health, and quality education. These are a useful point of departure for an examination as, uh, like this because these are the SDGs which fall primarily in the camp of the public sector. Our results reveal that if domestic resource mobilization, and by that we mean ability to tax and generate revenues, um, stays unchanged, then to achieve only those four SDGs by 2030, it would require those countries to raise debt to well over 180% of their GDP um, by 2030, or to grow every year by 12% for the next 10 years. Now, clearly those extremes are never going to be realistic. So what instead we need is the international community to help plug the <coughs> holes associated with illicit financial flows. One might say that these illicit financial flows are brutalizing the capacity of developing countries to mobilize domestic resources. That brings us to the measurement of illicit financial flows and the project that Fernando is now going to introduce us to. Clearly, we are engaged in developing something that is needed here, that needs to have appropriate policy outcomes, and that can indeed make a difference. We know that once you develop a measure, it becomes a target, a policy target, and of course, we know that there have been those, like Charles Goodhart, who've said that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure, precisely because one can't always anticipate the outcomes on policy. Now, in the process that we've undertaken, that Fernando is going to outline for you, you will see that we are very um, conscious of those concerns of how we actually elicit appropriate policy outcomes. And without any further ado, I'm now going to introduce you to Fernando Cantu, who is a senior statistician 
at the Statistics and Information Branch of UNCTAD. He works on statistical analysis and the development of methodologies for estimation and forecasting on areas related to trade, services, investment, and finance. Before UNCTAD, he worked at the UN Regional Commissions, as well as the ILO and the OECD. He holds a Master's in Applied Statistics from a Mexican university, and both a Master's and PhD in Econometrics from the University of Geneva. Thank you for now. Thank you so much, uh, Penelope, for the uh, introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's really, really great to be here uh, to this uh, large audience. Um, and um, to start with, I mean, I, I have the first uh, the first talk of the the panel, so um, that's always a good thing because I can uh, I, I can start and say a lot of things, and uh, then the the rest will have to uh, adjust <laughs> around what I'm saying. No, but in this case, I, I just want to go to something. Um, a bit more uh, specific, which is the the work we have been doing in terms of the SDG indicator 16.4.1 on illicit financial flows. Um, here you will see the subtitle, it says statistical framework and measurement challenges. It, it looks a bit scary, but don't worry, it will not be technical. It will just highlight the main issues uh, that we're facing, how we're going about it, and the progress we have uh, achieved so far. So, um, sorry. Okay, so just instead of an, an outline, I will just present the three main points I will cover in the presentation. So first of all is I want to put this IFF's uh, uh, discourse in, uh, in the context, I mean, I'm the opposite, I'm sorry, the illicit trade that main theme of the conference, what you were talking yesterday, in, uh, in as part of a, uh, the broader uh, concept of illicit financial flows. I will also talk about the impact of illicit financial flows on development, why is this so important, uh, why we're actually working on this and why there's a, a growing interest in, in this topic. Then finally I will talk about, and I will mention the, that uh, we, we really need evidence, we really need data to guide policy uh, to be able to, to monitor what's happening, to see if we're progressing, if we're regressing, uh, and also to, 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 to fight this curse. And I will, here in this, in this context, I will talk to, uh, I will summarize the, the um, progress on the indicator 16.4.5. Okay, so just to get us started, uh, Lisa, I guess you, you know very well, uh, <coughs> IFFs is part of Indicator 16 on peace, justice, and uh, institutions. One of the main uh, differences between the previous development framework, the MDGs, and the current SDGs is that they went be beyond these outcome measures uh, on human development. They incorporated the three pillars of development, and they also took into account that this cannot take place in a vacuum. You actually need uh, support systems from within the government, uh, from within the countries, from outside as well. So they put uh, many of these, uh, let's say, cross-cutting uh, areas in, inside in the, uh, SDG Indicator 16, and IFFs is part of it. More specifically, we're in SDG tar in the target 16.4, which reads, uh, by 2030, significantly reduce IFFs and armed flows, strengthen the recovery and return of stolen assets, and combat all forms of organized crime. Within there, there's a set of indicators. Uh, we are concerned with SDG indicator 16.4.1, total value of inward and outward illicit financial flows. Okay, so just to give you some context about this indicator. Um, as you know, when uh, the, the SDGs, the 17 goals, and the different targets, they were set up and agreed by the international community, and they started in 2015. And then the statistical commission was charged with developing indicators to be able to measure them. And this was a huge task because, as I said, like, it was a very ambitious agenda. They went to uh, very different topics, very varied type of uh, targets, and uh, things that the statistical community had never tried to measure before, or there was, they didn't see it as part of their mandate, let's say. 
so there was a huge effort from the different uh, representatives uh, of the statistical uh, bodies in all countries and all international agencies to come up with the indicators that were published uh, in 2017. And then they listed the indicators for each target had one or two indicators. And then they, they gave them a, a ranking, let's say. They said some of them are tier one, meaning that they're well known, there's methodology, there's data. These are things like poverty, child mortality, uh, you know, number of years of education, because all that we already have. The, some indicators were given a, a rank or a score of tier two, saying, okay, everybody knows the concept, everybody knows what you're talking about, but there's still no data. And then number, tier number three is the hardest. It was a tier three, meaning there's still no consensus. N nobody really knows, uh, or, or, or there's no uh, an international agreement on what you mean by this. Plus, there's no data. You know? And here there were many, many different things. Let's say, for example, sustainable tourism was there, because what do you actually mean by sustainable tourism, or, or something like that? And this was the case of 16.4.1, because there was no agreement on IFFs. A lot of people were talking about it. It was already in all in the, of the development uh, uh, talks and uh, agenda, but it was still some, somewhat nebulous. Um, as a result of all the work uh, we and all of the, the, the international community has done in this, uh, in this uh, area, we submitted a reclassification request uh, earlier uh, in the, it's already last year, in the middle of last year, uh, and uh, we're happy to, to tell you that this was approved. So now we have moved to tier two. That means that we have shown that we reach an agreement on, uh, so through a, an extensive consultation, through a long process, we reach an agreement on what we mean. So what's the concept? What is the scope? What is the typology of IFFs? So that's why we, we're now moving to a tier two. Uh, well now, of course, this is only, let's say, the start of the, the process, then we really need to go into actually measuring it, producing data. So that's what we're working on. And uh, just to tell you what was, uh, what was agreed, what was there, uh, this was the definition of IFFs that we have. Financial flows that are illicit in origin, transfer or use, that reflect an exchange of value, and across country borders. So there's three elements in the definition. The first one, financial flows that are illicit in origin, transfer, and use. Just to show you some examples here, I, I put a little uh, diagram. And you see we have flows that are illicit by their origin, that was the first circle on your left. Then the ones that are illicit because of the way they're transferred. And then thirdly, the, way th the ones that are illicit because of how they're used. Of course, this is not separate concepts. They are interlinked. Many flows that can be illicit uh, because of their origin, then they're also transferred Ill illicitly. Um, so we have many different cases. Let me tell you, for example, is illicit in origin. That means, we, with that we mean uh, transactions or, or uh, activity that is illicitly generated. For example, flows originated from criminal activities. Uh, or from uh, tax evasion, which is clearly uh, illicit since the beginning. Uh, that would be, let's say, the, the circle around A, that part. Then we have the, the funds, the, uh, the flows that are illicit in transfer, that they can be, that they can come from legal, legal illicit, I mean, illicit activities. But then what makes them illicit is the actual transfer. For example, when they are, there's currency controls, and even though you know, the money comes from legal sources, then you find ways around those controls or to avoid embargoes or something like that. Then they become illicit because of that transfer. The other ones is the funds that are uh, illicit in use. That means, for example, you have there's money that has been legally, illicitly generated, but then it's transferred to fund terrorism or to transfer or to use to f fund a illegal activity. So then it becomes as I said, these are very much interlinked. That's why we, 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 we you know, try to outline more or less uh, what we mean, but we, we mark that uh, they're all very linked. So this is the first part. The second part is that uh, there are flows that reflect an exchange of value. And then I added a bit uh, 
instead of a purely financial transaction. So this is not only about moving money, transfer money from bank to bank. There's just a lot of different activities that can be taken uh, that transfer value. It can be just directly moving uh, goods and services, you know, across border illegally, uh, etc. I mean, there's many other ways. So th this is a, a very broad categorization. And finally, uh, we're here talking only about flows across borders. There can also be domestic illicit flows uh, that we're aware, but since the objective of this uh, exercise or, or all the work is to uh, measure indicator 16.4.1, which clearly says inward and outward illicit financial flows, then we're really concentrated only on illicit financial flows that cross borders. That doesn't mean that the other ones we ignore or we say we turn a blind eye, no. At the same time, when, uh, many times when we measure something, you, you have to measure the whole universe or at least have some uh, indications of what's happening. So, uh, but our main target is those flows across border and that involve several countries and because of that they require international cooperation. Okay, now about, so that's the definition. You see it's a huge uh, uh, term, yeah, a lot of things are there. So we want to have some sort of order, some sort of uh, categories to, to you know, organize uh, ourselves. So the the IFFs we can we can classify from many in many different ways. We can it can be for example by from the source, uh, from the channels, it, how they are they transferred between the the countries, by the impacts they have, by the actors that are involved. Is it companies? Is it uh, you know individuals? Is it uh, you know uh, uh, etc. Or by the motives? Is it to to gain profit? Is it to reduce taxes? Is it to uh, you know, avoid uh, uh, controls? Is it to finance the illegal uh, activities, etc.? So there's many ways to, 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 to do it. We chose the one we proposed uh, and that was approved by the Statistical Commission. It was the, um, the, to, to classify the IFFs according to the underlying activities where, where they emerge. So in this case, we have four types. That's the way we classify them. Um, the first one, um, tax and commercial practices. Here is uh, every, everything, all these I I transfers of money across borders, illicitly, that is done for a, 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 with a tax and commercial, uh, you know, uh, in a context of a tax and commercial practice. Here, I mean, it, it goes from really uh, illegal practices such as uh, tax evasion, market manipulation, tax offenses, etc. But we also included uh, uh, other practices such as tax avoidance, uh, including its many forms, uh, transfer mispricing, debt shifting, uh, the reallocation of IPs to reduce tax uh, burden, etc., etc. This I will, I will cover in detail uh, later on. The second type of uh, IFFs is related to illegal markets. Here is everything that is uh, related to illicit goods and services. It can be trafficking of drugs, trafficking of illegal uh, firearms. It can also be smuggling of uh, Ill people illegally, migrants, etc. Um, the third group is the theft, theft type and terrorism financing, where we put, uh, this is all, all uh, they're not transactions, they're not productive activities. Uh, and they involve this forced uh, and involuntary transfer of uh, economic resources. You know, this is everything related to theft, extortion, um, uh, kidnapping, and all that. When that then is transferred outside the country, then it becomes an IFF. Then finally, we have we have corruption, um, where we have uh, bribery, embezzlement, abuse of uh, functions, trade influence. Okay, just to give you some examples, uh, very quickly, uh, within that context of uh, illicit uh, trade, to just to see where the, the, some examples of illicit trade, how they are put inside uh, this context. Let's say we have that trade from products that originate illegal markets, such as, I don't know, illegal wildlife products or illegal uh, timber, etc. All that will be uh, as part of the second box on illegal markets. We also have um, 
um, trade from products that vi violate regulations, quotas, or restrictions, it can also be considered there as a, that's an, an illicit transfer. We have trade of st stolen products that will be in the third box of the theft type. Uh, and then, for example, trade misinvoicing. It's also where the, it, it's, a, it's a, a legal production, so there was no, but it, they become illicit when they transfer it by hiding the quantity, lying on the price, or trying in, in order to avoid, let's say, paying taxes or avoiding controls. Okay, so what's the impact of this on, on development? So the impacts, I mean, they can be very functional, very specific uh, uh, impacts, you know, depending on each type of, of uh, you know, IFF. For example, if you're trading in illegal timber, obviously this affects uh, SDG 15, life on land. If you uh, trade in products from illegal <coughs> or uh, unregulated fishing, then it's SDG 14, and like that. So each one has their own. But the impact goes much, much beyond. We, we also argue that they have systemic inputs. They, they just harm the whole um, uh, economy and the whole system, the whole, um, and I think this is the reason why behind uh, why they were placed in the SDG 16. But they have a very strong uh, undermining effect on institutions. They weaken state institutions, they undermine the rule of law, they decrease trust because you know, if all these people are transferring illegally, they're not paying taxes, why would I still do it? Uh, of course, they finance terrorism, uh, they create uh, uh, conflicts, uh, so they, they create this. And more beyond that, they also reduce the, the, the capacity of the states to, to uh, uh, collect taxes, let's say, because a lot of it just goes through unregulated markets, it goes, uh, it, it's on purpose transferring ways to avoid uh, paying taxes, so it reduces the, mobi the, the mobilization of resources domestically. Uh, and that has an effect on all SDGs, obviously, because there's less resources to uh, do development programs uh, to support uh, the people that need it. There's also effects on uh, policy because it, it distorts the market. You don't really know. Uh, people are actively trying to, you know, if you put a currency control or some sort of uh, regulation and people go around it, but it, affects, it, it reduces its, its effectiveness. So that's why it's for us is very important. Which brings us to the measurement, as uh, Penelope uh, mentioned, which uh, in order to, to, to see what to do, to try to reduce them, to design policy, uh, and, and to see if the policy we're implementing is effective in reducing the IFFs, we need information. Um, and not only information, but we need disaggregated information. I know the SDG is total IFFs. This is just you know a, a summary a headline figure uh, for advocacy purposes, but actually for policy we need disaggregation. We need to know what is, is coming from tax practices and what type of tax practices and what are the channels so that then uh, the, the policy makers can see how to, to fight them. And then once you do, you measure again in a few years and see, okay, your policy had an effect or not. Uh, so in that context, uh, we as the custodians of the indicators together with OBC, uh, we're proposing a, a disaggregated approach to estimate these IFFs. Uh, so basically we have the four boxes and we want to estimate each one separately using separate methods. We in UNCTAD, we are um, focusing on the first one because of our mandate. That's why I, I cover most of that. The other ones, uh, they're more in, within UNODC, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, mandate, and this uh, Enrico will uh, cover later, so I will not touch that, I'll leave it to him. Um, and for each one we identify different methodologies, um, and then at the end we can try to aggregate. This I will not go into detail, but there's, there's a lot of ways to, to measure uh, illicit financial flows from the tax and related sites. One of them is, for example, to identify mismatches as, for example, the great work that has been done by GFI, uh, where they see, they compare trade statistics, and they say, okay, A says that they're exporting this to B, but B says that they're receiving a, a different amount. So by exploring those differences, we can see, you know, there's, there, there's, uh, there's things that are not being reported. Uh, the same way with banking deposits. You know, we have these databases where we know how many, you know, let's say, in Switzerland, we know uh, the people from France are depositing this amount of money. But then in France, only a reduced amount is reported, you know? So th there's a gap there that we can exploit. 
The same thing with the task gap. Given the level of economic activity, we will expect to receive this level of tax, and we're already receiving less. So then we can try to go into the detail of why, what's happening. Part of it can be due to policy or to other things, but then there's part of it that is unexplained and that can be attributed to IFRS. Same thing with performance of uh, industries. Let's say, for example, some cases you see multinationals uh, versus domestic enterprises in the same country, and the multinationals are extremely low profit compared to a domestic comparable enterprise, let's say, in the same sectors, more or less same size. The domestic enterprise has a certain amount of taxes, but then the, the, the multinationals, they show very, very uh, low profitability because the profits are moved away to other countries to different channels. This is also an effect. Also, we have extended definitions, for example, in, in, and that's very important for us in terms of foreign direct investment, because sometimes we just report where the investment is going to the next country. But then there's more and more data that is giving us the ultimate uh, investor, because sometimes the, the money goes out as an investment to country B, but then from B goes to C, and then from C goes to D, and from D goes back to A. And this we don't report, we just report the link to one, to the next country, but with these new statistics that have uh, the ultimate investor, we can actually see all these. Uh, and then there's just new sources that keep appearing, the country by country reporting will provide a lot, uh, very quickly, I'm gonna finish. Uh, just some of the challenges, as you can imagine when you saw this list. Uh, there's some conceptual issues sometimes. Uh, we still, uh, in terms of what we mean, uh, not everyone then agrees. So there's a lot still of work there. There's also, as you can imagine, limited availability of data. Only some countries report these statistics. Uh, and then it's also partially, uh, it's not complete coverage. And also the countries that are most affected by these many times are developing countries and where there's uh, less uh, uh, data available. Also, the estimates, as you can imagine, they're based on very sensitive information. Sometimes it's just at the transaction level, uh, at the company level, this cannot be made public. So even if you estimate it, then you cannot really show uh, the underlying data because it's confidential or has some uh, problem. And then, as I mentioned, we try to uh, identify the, uh, or measure the different IFFs, types of IFFs separately, and then aggregate, but this creates a problem of uh, double counting. Because what, for example, if you, do some sort of uh, an illicit transfer, but to facilitate that you, you know, do also do some uh, corruption. Uh, uh, so if you count them separately, then they will, when you sum them, you will be counting the same thing twice. So there's also a lot of work to be there. Just for the, the activities where uh, we're working here in, uh, in UNCTAD, uh, so we're, we're now, now that the concept has been approved and, and we're now a tier two indicator. We want to move to the next stage, which is actually to develop these methodologies more in detail to measure the tax and commercial uh, practices. And then we want to develop some guidelines that the countries can apply uh, to try to, to test some of these methodologies to see if they work, to see if the data is there, to see if it's you know easily shared, easily shared between the institutions, etc. Uh, and the ultimate purpose, of course, is to have more information on this topic, inform the SDG 16.4.1 and also uh, inform policy on this, and of course, build more advocacy around this, uh, the harm of uh, illicit financial flows uh, on, on development. So just to conclude, um, very quickly, we're, uh, there's a growing recognition of uh, the problems of IFFs, the harms it does to development, um, and it's essential to have more, to keep working on it, to have more information, to build the statistical inf infrastructure around it, and then the countries can apply. So as part of it, we are working with uh, UNODC, we're working with uh, many different partners to try to develop these, uh, these methods. Um, um, we are now uh, moving ahead this year and next year with some pilot, piloting testing of the first method, uh, or first pilot testing of the methodologies in several countries in Africa first, but also Latin America, later on Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and for that, it's, uh, let's say we have uh, support from the development account of the UN, so if any of you is interested to participate in the future, we'll be very interested, please get in touch. Uh, or even then just, you know, to, to continue discussing the topic, to continue uh, highlighting its importance uh, for development uh, and why it's, it's really important to have this, uh, this uh, data to be able to monitor. So this is my email uh, contact, just please feel free to contact me happy to continue the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Fernando. I think everybody has a, a better idea now um, about how we're approaching this process. Um, because I think the presentations are linked, I think if um, you'll bear with me, Richard, I think we'll go straight to Enrico's presentation. Um, Enrico Bosognio is currently leading the Data Development and Dissemination Unit at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in Vienna. In his capacity, he is responsible for developing and implementing the statistical program of his office, including activities related to the sustainable development goals in the areas of violence, security, organized crime, rule of law, corruption, and drug treatment. He has led the finalization of the International Classification of Crime for Statistical Purposes and the Manual on Corruption Surveys. Capacity building activities to support countries in the field of crime and criminal justice statistics and the production of global data reports on selected drug and crime topics. He has previously worked for the National Statistical Office in Italy, the UN Commission for Europe, and the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Enrico holds a PhD in demography, in demography from the University of Rome and a Master's in Statistics and Demography from the University of Padua. Enrico, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, yeah, I'm uh, also very uh, happy and impressed by the, the, the audience, so the interest for, for these topics. Um, the good news for you is that uh, we, I can skip already five uh, slides because they were already uh, well uh, presented by Fernando. And then I will, uh, yeah, I will take from this one, uh, just to, um, yeah, to reconnect with uh, what uh, Fernando was saying. Um, just to make a few you know, additional remarks. Uh, you know, w the term least financial flows is often uh, um, used uh, is in very, very different uh, areas, very different audiences, very different policy issues. It can be related uh, to tax, tax issues, evasions, avoidance, uh, where it it's, uh, probably also was born in a way as also as a term. But then it's used uh, very often in terms of you know, corruption, uh, rec uh, you know, recovery of so stolen assets, for example, uh, in terms of financing of terrorism, and then in terms of uh, you know what uh, everything that goes around illegal illegal markets illegal trade, so this to say that of course every, we use the same term, but uh, maybe we we mean different things or at least we have different interests. So it's a um, it's very important that we have this kind of uh, you know when we look at this yeah, it's a uh, this issue. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, we look at GDP in a country, okay, we, we want to know whether it's growing, decreasing, and so on, but it's um, even more interesting to know where it's growing, why it's decreasing, yeah? So because otherwise it's a number, yeah, it's a number, yeah. The number itself doesn't say much, huh? uh, and I can, we see a lot of numbers <laughs> uh, in the work we do, and uh, a number in itself doesn't say much. Uh, even uh, often it, it's, uh, it creates confusion, but they, when it's uh, disaggregated, when it's explained, then it gives uh, information, uh, it gives value. And this is why we really believe it's important to keep this uh, disaggregated approach, because uh, um, being able to say we have in country A this amount of illicit flows uh, flowing out of the country because of drug trafficking or because of wildlife traffic is one thing, yeah. It, 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 somebody can, interest, uh, can find really interest huh? and the seeing whether it's increasing, decreasing, where it's flowing, where it's coming from. That's the value. Giving a, you know, an, an aggregate number, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We really don't know uh, what, uh, uh, what the information it can provide. And also, we also have, for example, we have to remember that uh, also the same, uh, the very indicator says in, uh, illicit financial flows inward and outward. So already the indicators is clearly telling us, we, we want to know yeah, how much is coming into the country and how much is flowing out of the country. It's not a number, it's not a net. Yeah, we are not interested in net uh, uh, effect. 
So this is a, yeah, again, just to um, yeah, reiterate the importance of, uh, you know, uh, having this uh, uh, kind of disaggregated approach uh, and uh, trying to then for each of them, that's uh, what we are trying, uh, what uh, Fernando said, trying to, you know, develop dedicated uh, methodology because we are talking about very different topics. Uh, so measuring illegal markets mean, means, and this is where I will also go a little bit more in detail, means understanding how the trade of a certain illegal good or service is working. Mm? What is the, the value chain? Where it is produced, how it is trafficked, where it is consumed. So this is what we are doing. And uh, just to give you an example, yeah, very simple. <laughs> uh, if we think about uh, any, um, oh, oh, what also I'm tr trying to convey, any uh, form of illegal uh, markets, uh, illegal good in this case, where there is a, in a country, in the, uh, you know, there is some drugs going into the, into the country, or this can be illicit drugs, it can be anything else. Huh? Firearms can be uh, wildlife, uh, uh, protected species. So when there is, it's flowing into the country, of course, somebody is paying for that. Huh? So uh, there is already a, a first uh, financial flow uh, related to this illegal trade. Huh? So this is a, uh, the first element we have to take into account. Yeah, when, how much, because it's a, one thing we always have to keep in mind also that is a list of financial flows are not only, you know, the, the duct, detracting resources from a country, but they also, in a way or another, bringing resources. Huh? Because uh, if we sell uh, uh, drugs uh, or any other illegal good, somebody is making money, somebody is, is a contribution to the economy. We, of course, we don't like it, but <laughs> that's, uh, uh, this is where we're trying to fight it, but th that's the reality. Huh? There is fl money flowing into the country or into the, uh, people who are selling, in produ producing, and selling. Um, so this is one first element. Then, in this same country, once the, ma the money, the drug has uh, arrived into the country, there are some activities that are done: processing, uh, wholesale, reta retail sale, and so on. So, income is generated. Hmm? Income is generated within the country, and then part of this income will eventually go out abroad to be invested in any other kind of uh, uh, multiple forms of uh, you know, uh, assets. So you see, it's in very important when we talk about illegal, illegal markets especially, but not only, that we keep in mind that uh, at least two steps, I mean, illicit financial flows are created at least in two, in, uh, two stages of the process. When there is uh, some, something flowing into the country and when the income that uh, the, is generated from the illegal activities is eventually invested abroad. So there is a, uh, yeah, it's a, we call them, you know, income, uh, illicit financial flows generated in, when income is generated, yeah, so in, when they trade, this is what is related to the illegal trade. In the illegal trade, again, there are several forms, we say, we, uh, when we, uh, we have, you have a conference here, I understand, so you have been <laughs> dealing with uh, all of them, uh, many of them. So there is a illicit financial flows uh, generated when there is a, this kind of illegal trade uh, taking place. And then there is a illicit financial flows uh, when uh, yeah, the, the, the value that is created, the income that is generated is managed by those who have it and some, we know that a part of that, a share of that is uh, eventually invested abroad. And this is, a, is not only a, if you want a statistical exercise uh, that we like doing because we like uh, putting things in order, but really I have, I have a different, uh, these two components are, are very different in nature because one is, uh, and then you will see from the example, one is uh, uh, the illicit financial flows that are really uh, mm, related to the illegal trade, and then often in, uh, is benefiting, for example, countries that have some uh, resources, or natural resources, or illegal goods that are generated and then eventually sold abroad. And this is something that is flowing into the country in terms of you know, financial resources. While the other one is uh, the income, uh, is the part of illicit financial flows that is generated, thank 
thanks to these uh, illegal activities, but that eventually will be, uh, yeah, in many cases, invested abroad. So this is, uh, again, we have to keep both uh, elements into account when we talk about illicit financial flows. And then, of course, then there are different uh, f data needs for each of them. I wouldn't go into that, but uh, of course they, um, they have to be dealt separately in the, in the estimation uh, phase. Um, I just want to show you uh, one example. Uh, uh, the, ca the case of, uh, just to, again, without going into details, but technically detail, but just to show how, the, how it would work in a case like, uh, for example, Afghanistan uh, in relation to opiates trafficking. Uh, for Afghanistan, thanks to, you know, a lot, I mean, there is a lot of work that has been done by the office and by the country uh, in the last uh, 20 years or more, there are very good data on, uh, there is a very good information on the production of uh, um, opium uh, and the entire, you know, not only the production, but also the entire value chain, so the processing and the, the, and the, the sale and the trafficking. This is the uh, time series, just to give an idea, how much opium is produced uh, in this period. You see a lot of volatility. Um, but from uh, this to say that, uh, okay, we have, we have very good information how much is produced. We have good information of the prices, which we have good information on the consumption in the country, so from which we can uh, estimate how much is exported. So then, there are, of course, there are a number of technicalities because um, also there are seizures, there are many things to take into account. So it's not a really a, a, a simple uh, calculation, but still, at the end of the process, we can say how much, we can estimate how much money is generated, how much you know, yeah, uh, income is generated every year in the country, thanks to uh, opiates, uh, and, and what is the value of exports. And this is the, the third line that you see there, between one and 2.1 billion in this 2018, I believe. Yeah, it's 2018. This is the amount of money that has been, in a way, uh, mm, has been flowing to the country because of the sale of, uh, uh, of uh, opiates. Uh, so, and this is a, so in this chart here, you can see the line, the blue line, across the years is the, the amount of, uh, uh, of money that we estimate has been flowing into the country thanks to opiates, uh, opiates uh, trafficking, production and then trafficking, which uh, uh, is always a percentage um, uh, between 5-10% of GDP. So you can imagine in a country like in this case Afghanistan, um, what is the value of illicit financial flows, uh, in the, yeah, the contribution of, the, of uh, opiate production and trafficking to the GDP of the country. So we, uh, we now have to estimate, and this, we still, uh, this is something we are working on, how much of this, the money that is generated in the country then eventually goes abroad is invested by those who made money, <coughs> profited from this uh, uh, market to, yeah, and then create the other uh, component of the least financial flows, the one generated to the management of the income. But this is already a, starting, a good starting point. Uh, this, is a, this was a, yeah, an example of uh, Afghanistan. We are, we are always a bit sorry to talk about Afghanistan because it's the country that is, uh, um, I mean, for which we, it's, sometimes we tend to point to the country because they, it's a country where we have a lot of good information. But of course, and then uh, it often happens that the case, this, then the countries where, from where you have good information, they always, uh, maybe in the international fora, uh, they look maybe bad, but just because we have the information, but there are many other countries, of course, where sim uh, similar activities take place. But uh, in, again, in the case of Afghanistan and drug opiates, uh, we have uh, yeah, um, a very consolidated, uh, good quality data. Just, I'm going yeah, to the end, uh, just to say that we are repeating the same type of exercises in five countries in Latin America. So Colombia for cocaine trafficking, trafficking persons, illegal mining. Ecuador for cocaine and trafficking persons. Mexico, cocaine, heroin, smuggling of migrants. Panama, cocaine, Peru, cocaine. So in the, uh, we are quite advanced stage of the, uh, these pilot uh, studies, and so uh, by June we should 
we, uh, we are confident we will have a res similar results also for these countries. And also, as uh, Fernando said, we are continuing this kind of uh, studies uh, where, you know, uh, we do, we have to do, we have to understand, you know, work, um, understand how the, the individual in the legal markets work before we can produce uh, solid, uh, reasonable estimates, but we can see that it's, uh, it's feasible. And we are partnering with this, also the authorities of these countries, again, to, to produce uh, these, uh, uh, these estimates. Um, and to conclude, yeah, we believe that this approach, while of course it's a, it's a demanding, in a way, approach, because we need a data, we need a, uh, ownership, uh, partnership of the countries, because we always work with, you know, with the uh, statistical offices, with the financial institutions of the countries, and so, but uh, at the end, it can produce really um, yeah, valuable, relevant data for, uh, for all the work forms of, uh, of uh, illicit financial flows. Um, and this is also, in, is important to also to take into account. This is like something that is really also grounded on the work of uh, that the statistical agencies in general are doing to integrate illegal activities in the national accounts. So that they, more and more countries, that is, for example, in the European Union, is also a regulation. Uh, and this is a recommendation from all, you know, at <coughs> international level, UN, IMF, World Bank, to include also the illegal activities in the national economy accounts because this is the this is the way it works and this is the uh, illegal activities whether of course we like it or not we, I mean we don't like but they contribute to the, the economy uh, in some way it's distorting but they they are there and they uh, and the, <coughs> the, the the statistics have to reproduce that so it's a, a method that is uh, really built into what the, other, the countries are doing um, we hope that yeah, we, we will we'll be able to produce results soon, uh, as I said, and uh, uh, we hope to continue, we will continue these activities of piloting in other areas of the world. And again, if there is any country interested, yeah, please let us know. Thank you so much for your attention.